It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. This week, starring very special guest star, Mr. Ben McLean. Yeah! Woo! Welcome, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> Whoops. Um, ben is an old friend. Of, well, not he's not old, but I mean, we've known each other for a long time. Um, he is a music attorney here in Los Angeles that uh, is highly recommended, and uh, I've only heard good things, which is pretty good for an attorney. Well, we try. We try. <laughs> you got to keep good reputation. <laughs> yep. And he's worked with a lot of great people. I included a link in the email I sent out to you guys earlier. Um, Okay, hopefully, I opened the chat room, and hopefully you guys, there we are. There's Scott Hansen. Tonight, uh, one of our members owns a restaurant. Tonight, we're serving linguine and clam sauce with our house salad, homemade focaccia bread, of course, in a glass of Bogle Essential red wine. Bogel? Bogel? Whatever. Um, anyway, uh, I'm really glad that Ben is here. Um, I've wanted to get him on the show for a while. Uh, he teaches at Musicians Institute. He doesn't only do music law, but is it fair to say that's the main uh, for us? Yeah, that's probably the the uh, 90%, and the rest would be film, TV, fashion, internet, things of that nature. Wow, that fashion. Kind of, they all touch. They all touch music or entertainment. Yeah. Fashion, too. Well, we have, that's another story, but we have a fashion line. My family does. So. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, and, and he teaches at the Road Rally. And, and thank uh, you for having me. Oh, always a pleasure. Um, I'm sure the people that are in your class are, are very fortunate to be there. So I'm going to start out by playing a song, as we always do, and we'll do a little critique on that, and then we'll get right to your questions. So um, definitely start getting your questions ready. Um, and I would say in less than five minutes, we'll start with those. So the song we're going to play is entitled Sleeping with the Enemy. And let's have a listen, and we will take a crack at giving some advice. I let you in the dark This morning finally found the light When you gave me a heart
And the answer is, somebody asked, what's the name of the song? It was Sleeping with the Enemy. Oops, still is Sleeping with the Enemy. Um, we never tell the artist's name unless sometimes they go, hey, that's me, uh, even though they give us permission to play it. So uh, didn't you actually do A&R for a while before, during, or at some point when you... Yeah, uh, well, I've been a, a talent scout for labels, but... And since occasionally we shop artists, our right. firm does, I feel like I am an a &R <laughs> person because really we're the first filter a lot of times before managers or the real a &R people at the labels even pay attention. Yep. You know, the lawyers get involved early sometimes. So, yeah, so uh, I'm always listening for hits too, just like Want to comment? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, any... I, I, well, I, I really liked uh, her voice, really liked her voice. I thought the song was good. It was an interesting arrangement. The kind of it wasn't a traditional formula in this verse chorus for you know, it was it was kind of rearranged and it, I didn't I'd probably have to listen again, but just there was some surprises in the way it was arranged, I thought. Um, yeah, and it, it had some memorable hooks in it. So I'd probably want to hear more from somebody like that just to see what else they're doing. I happen to know this young lady and, and my feeling is every time I've heard something of hers, it's really close but not quite there. And it's just a matter of time till well, I have she a gets feeling, her. I have a, if you played that for Interscope or Atlantic, they probably would say that. They'd probably right. say, you're right on the verge, but you know it's n it's not an undeniable hit or whatever. And how how it's an opinion-based business, so right. that's the thing. And everybody's got one. Everybody's got one, but... Um, you know, and that's very, you know, when you're doing pop stuff, it, you know. The bar is yeah, high. It, very high, very high. But she's close, so obviously I would encourage her to keep going. It, it, it's definitely contemporary, and she does have a great voice. Um, I can't see if and, she's in there or not. I'm not and with, and with, a, with a female artist, obviously the image, the look, all that's a big plays a big role in it. So I, I don't know what, what's going on in that aspect of her career. She's, that might make a big difference. She's very, very pretty. Yeah, I've you. met her in person. She was at the road rally, mm -hmm. and she's a very pretty young lady, and she's very driven and works very hard, takes us very seriously. So she's got all that good stuff going for her. Um, but even when you look at, at Lady Gaga or Katy Perry, they're excellent singers, by the way, but they have amazing images. Yeah. Which really, which may have, like me, when I first saw a picture of Lady Gaga, I'd never heard the music, but I saw some odd, like she was pulling a mic out of her, it looked like she was pulling a mic out of her <laughs> mouth, and she had leather and the white wig, and I was like, what, who is, the, you yeah. wanted to find out more. I frankly yeah. discounted her because she seemed to rely so much on her <laughs> costumes, and then when I saw the uh, Monsters Ball thing on HBO or wherever it was, I was blown away and became a fan, because that woman can sing. She can sing, and she uh, can play, too. Yeah, the stuff at the end uh, where she, they when they were rolling credits, they showed them backstage warming up before the show, she can sing her butt off amazing vocalist. So I, I agree with Ben. I, I had to sit down on the lyric sheet. I did listen to this one before the show, which is unusual. Uh, and, and I had to like write, okay, here's the verse, here's the chorus. Um, it didn't feel that much like they were obvious verses and choruses because even though the chorus is bigger, it doesn't get that much bigger. And I frankly got lost in the verse lyric because there were a lot of the phrases that were hard to understand. So it didn't engage me. It sucked me in. I didn't feel committed to the song. And then all of a sudden I went, oh, I think this might be the chorus. Um, so what's uh, like the line, lying like a criminal, um, which is in the first uh, chorus. Uh, I made a note said enunciate. I, it just went right by and I couldn't catch it. And then, come on, baby, follow me. Uh, I like my love delusional. Well, you're talking. You're talking to him, presumably a him because it's a female singing to her love interest. Um, I like my love delusional. Well, it's confusing. You're going from talking to him to talking about yourself. So why not make that follow up line? Loving loving me is delusional. Um, that way you're still talking to him, but making the same point. Um, again, I underlined in the chorus, uh, when I'm howling like an animal, uh, the second half of that line just flew right by, couldn't understand it. Sleeping with the enemy, which is the hook of the song, wasn't as pronounced and as well enunciated as it should have been because it is the hook. Um... And then the bridge, you go into sleep, 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 keep your enemies closer, sleep, 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 one eye open. 
And then you go back into the chorus again, but then it goes back into that bridge section again is the outro of the song, which I think is what you were refer referring to as far as the structure being kind of atypical. And it's cool. And it got even cooler at the end of the song. Um, she broke it down and just went very rhythmic with just like the, the drum pattern and the vocal. I mean, frankly, I think I would have gone that way on the bridge and gotten really close to the mic and made it really enunciated and really intimate and forceful um, and, and almost like deadly sounding, for lack of a, a quick answer on that. Uh, but I, I would have introduced that sooner, and I would frankly have repeated the chorus twice at the end rather than going back to the bridge. It felt a little antithetical, but uh, as Ben and I both agreed, it, it it's pretty darn good. Yeah, well, and it's just a personal thing, but yeah, when I, I like to hear more of an explosive vocal in the chorus, mm -hmm. but that's a production thing that can be, it's like when you hear a Dr. Luke or a Max Martin production, usually the the hook is, is or a Kelly Clarkson. It's just yeah. like, it just explodes out, you know. And this was trying but, to, but yeah. it didn't quite. But it didn't. But but if you're doing homemade demos, maybe it's and you're self-producing. Sometimes it's probably hard. But I'm you know I'm not a producer, and but I think some of those things it, the song could probably be better if it was produced differently. But that doesn't change the song itself. It's, and I, I do give her a lot of credit because she has taught herself how to engineer and produce and does this stuff at home uh, with her boyfriend. So, you know, you're on the right track, as so are, always. So are the, is the drumming, is that real drumming or is that no. samples? Uh, I would say it's a machine of some okay. sort. Um, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before, but pretty sure that was samples. Yeah, that was cool drumming. Yeah. Uh, okay, do we have questions? Um Does Michael ever, uh, ever well, um, let's not make this show about me. We've got a music attorney here. Every question you ever wanted to ask. Uh, it's extremely rare that I still screen anything at Taxi. So uh, I'm going to ask Ben one question, give you guys time, because there's like a 20-second delay from the time I said, oh, <laughs> there we go. Somebody's already got one. Uh, taxi stream, I don't know who that is. Ben, please explain how beneficial it is for a composer to a free to agree to a lifetime deal that only allows one 100 percent of writer share and the employer company to hold 100 percent of the publishers i think all income split 50 50 please clarify there's the question i'm not completely understanding it but i i think he's this person is talking about signing something to a publisher where they get 100 percent of the publishing and the writer keeps 100% of the writer's share, and that deal is in perpetuity. Okay. Uh, but what they didn't address is, is, are they talking about film and TV land, or are they talking about, you know, songs for radio and records, right. which is a different animal? Well, it could be it could be either or. I mean, if you're doing a deal with a publisher, uh, some publishers are trying to exploit music across the board. They're trying to get songs covered by Lady Gaga and Taylor Swift, and they're trying to pitch music for film and TV and advertisements and video games and collaborations, all of the above. But so, so I guess just if you're signing with a traditional publisher, and by the way, way back in the old school days when, when music publishing started, that was a traditional deal. Um, you know, when people would write songs in cubicles and, and the singers really didn't write their own music, they relied on the writers. So, and that was a traditional publishing deal, like the Tin Pan Alley days. Absolutely. You know, the writer would get hired by the publisher and the publisher would own the copyright and the writer would get the writer's share and they would split the money 50 50 and the the publisher would would keep 100 percent of the publishing and then i you know later on beatles and dylan when they started writing their own songs these co-publishing deals became a little more common and that's why you hear co-publishing deals where the writer gets to own half the publishing so then it the split is really 75 cents on the dollar and goes to the writer, the writer and right. 25 cents goes to the publisher now I that not that that's the the rule because I, I think the business has become very tough to make money in the last couple of years and if a publisher is going to take a chance on a new writer in particular that doesn't have a lot of credits it, it it's not uncommon for me to see publishers want to take a hundred percent of the publishing again now and as a as an artist rep I try to change that but if you have zero leverage and you're new you know sometimes you can't get around that and and obviously 
50% of something's better than 100% of nothing is the way you have to look at it sometimes. So it's a case by case thing whether that's that's the best deal to make. You know, as you as you move up in the business and start to get some covers and some action on your music, I think it's less likely that people will offer you those kinds of deals. But what I do try to put in every deal, if it's a co-publishing or 100% publishing, is a reversion. Mm -hmm. if, if the publisher doesn't exploit the song or make you some money within you know a couple years, a year, three years, two, whatever it is that seems fair, your rights come back. So, you know, no harm, no foul at that point. So it's not an in perpetuity thing. You know, if somebody is, is able to exploit your music and make you a lot of money and earn it, I don't have a big problem personally with in perpetuity stuff. Although, again, as an artist rep, you always try to ask for a reversion. Right. You know, at some point, 10 years, 15 years, always ask. But a lot of traditional publishers don't want to do that because they, they're building catalog, you see. Mm -hmm. They don't want to give the copyrights back or they have no catalog. Just, just like all these companies that we see, Sony, Warner, Chapel, Universal, they have catalog. That's why they're still in business. If, right. if all the copyrights reverted, they'd be out of business. So, But always ask for that. And also in film and TV, um, the lines are so blurred now that when a small film and TV specific publisher um, does a deal and they ask for it in perpetuity, a lot of times I think it's because they don't really have a good mechanism for calling the stuff back in. They've sent it out on drives to like a thousand post-production houses and music soups. So if they've got a three-year reversion, they can't be calling up all those people who have their drive full of music saying, okay, today I need you to delete this one, that one, and the other one. Right. So that's the argument I hear from libraries. Um, there are other libraries that will make that deal... Um, with a three-year reversion, in it, but there's a clause, I believe, that says something to the effect of, you get your copyright back in three years. However, if any of the connections we made for you by distributing your works on that drive happen, we still essentially like commission it at that. Yeah, point. they get their, and that's fair. They yeah. get they get the same pennies, you know, fifty percent of the income they'll get. They just won't own the the copyright right. anymore. Right, and that's fair enough because they're the ones that created the opportunity if they pitched it. Yeah. And eventually there's a bite, even if it's five years later. I think that's fair. I mean, I do too, but yeah. there, there's a hiccup with that, which mm -hmm. is let's say I'm the writer, you're the publisher, and I've got a three year reversion, and now I've got my song back three years and six months later. I cut a deal with another publisher. Right. Well, and, uh, and, and it's traceable to know yeah, how to, this. Yeah, you have to trace. I think, I think any smart publisher, though, they're going to, they're going to, be able to to prove who they sent it to, when they sent it. I mean, they should. They should have a, a log, and so if something ever happens, they can pin it back. Yeah. To you'll know who did the pitch, because ultimately, yeah, if the song comes back and you have a new publisher that pitches, then potentially they're pitching to the same party. Right. You know, but and then, but I ultimately, I've actually, I've never personally run into this where you have this this dispute about who <laughs> right. got it. Because battle. If somebody keeps good books and records about where they sent it. I think it's usually you can prove who got the placement. But again, I know it's possible that there could be some confusion. You know, that's the and, whole exclusive, non-exclusive <laughs> argument. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, okay, I'm looking for questions. Would you advise to register these anywhere so the songs are not stolen? Okay, so I think I had this in the email I sent out. Um, there are certain taxi members that tend to do almost all or mostly um, little instrumental cues, like 30 to 90 second instrumental cues. And they're really efficient at it and will crank out several a day. And they tend to put the stuff in catalogs that license a lot of stuff for no sync fee, typically MTV reality shows. And they don't even bother registering their music with ASCAP, or I mean, Copyright yeah. office. Well, they won't uh, do register it with the copyright office, and they don't even bother registering the stuff with their PRO because when it gets picked up by catalog A or catalog publisher A, B, whatever, they will then register their own copyright and with their PROs. Yeah. So not until the point where it gets picked up to do these writers even worry about registering stuff with a PRO. It seems a little scary to me. What's your take on it as a lawyer? <laughs> Well, in a perfect world, you yeah, you try to you try to register everything you can from from the beginning, but it can be cumbersome if you have that many cues. 
Yeah, these yeah. guys really do yeah. like two or three a day, and, five days a week. And, and and all I all I can say is is if from a copyright perspective, you know, you can do these collection of works yeah. where if you have multiple cues or multiple songs and you're the the sole writer or the same writers, you can, you know, put them all into you know, it used to be you'd put them all in a CD, mm -hmm. but now you can MP3 it. But I, I and honestly, I don't know if there's a limit. To that, I mean, usually you do it in chunks. Yeah. You know, 10, 10, 10, 15, 20, whatever it is. And, and you could actually, you know, you could actually protect yourself that way by just by at least registering them with the copyright office. If you're if you're submitting them out and there's a chance they could be stolen, it's better to do it than not to do it. Or, or at least maybe, you know, some other organization, I, I think even the, you know, well, anyway, ASCAP BMI. I, I again. I don't usually. I'm usually not the one that's uploading this stuff. Right. And I and I'm. But I'm sure they have a way to cr to keep track of a piece of a song, no matter how big it is. But I think they're more accustomed to full songs. So, um, I, I, I my recommendation is I think you at some point really should register these things if you can, because you're taking a risk otherwise. Because if it's stolen, then it's a he said she said situation. It may be hard. You know, if you, if you have a drive or a way to prove creation date, ultimately you can probably say this was mine. But if you I, want to spend the money yeah, to go to court it, to do yeah, that, yeah, it's a pain. It's a pain. But I and and obviously, if if you're that sloppy with your cues and somebody knows about it, some thief might. You know, it's a lot easier for them to take it. Have you? Uh, in let's say I've been in the industry, I think, for forty years now, and in all those years, the only copyright suits I've ever seen bear fruit or even be brought. Are always brought against guys like you know Michael Jackson or Paul McCartney or Prince or somebody big with deep pockets. What is your experience? I get asked this question a lot, so I'm asking it on yeah. behalf of our viewers. How often is does copyright print infringement actually take place? Well, I don't know how often it actually occurs because we only hear about the big lawsuits, <laughs> right? Or if somebody calls. I mean, I get calls all the time by people say, "Hey, my song sounds like." Yeah, that and I'm just like and but remember there's a lot of you have to prove substantial similarity which is almost an exact copy and then you have to prove that person that you say stole it had access to your music and you, you know, which is you know usually you had some kind of meeting or you sent it to them and, or taxi you know, submitted or, that's one of the things yes. we're proud of is that we keep copious yeah. records of everything there's a, yeah, so you can always say can't you know taxi sent it to this company in that date yeah so there's a way yeah there's a channel you can prove a channel so uh, assuming you can get all over those hurdles is it worth is it worth anything mm -hmm. you know? only if i always say i hope madonna has a big yes. hit if she steals my song because then it's well, worth then something. It, then it is worth something because then there's there's a lot of value there because otherwise you know, mo by the way, there's attorneys work two different ways. Litigation. When when you're doing copyright suits, it's federal court, mm -hmm. so you have to hire a copyright litigator. It's a specialized area of law. Very few attorneys actually sue in copyright court, and most of them want a big retainer to go in, unless they know it's a slam dunk Madonna case. They're not going to do it on what you call contingency, which is a back end. Right. Most of them, you know, if it's if it's, it's Jay Z, Eminem, Madonna, Taylor Swift. And and they really feel it's a slam dunk. You may find somebody that'll that'll waive their fee till they win the case. But but most of them want payment up front. You know, twenty five, fifty thousand dollars just to get going. So most people don't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're a new writer, so they you have to really think about: Is it worth going after somebody for this? Usually, it's not. You want to wait and see if it turns into something. You know, something's so that's why I think you don't in reality you don't see that many. That doesn't mean that it isn't going on, because we know there's a lot of, you know, rappers that sample and stuff and right. they, they intentionally, you know, they they try to mash things up and find things that are rare or they don't think you're gonna find out about or twist it up enough where they don't you know, that's because to them it's no big deal and they, they fit you know, but I mean it how I think that kind of stuff happens a lot. But again in the end I, the only time you really see a lawsuit or it gets publicized is when it's really valuable. And that's, that is rare. It's like very few things make it to that point. So I, I don't think it's that big of a deal in reality, but I know everybody freaks about, should I send my music there? Is somebody oh, yeah. going to steal it? I think it's better. I mean, if you never send your music out, you're never going to get an opportunity. Um, but certainly you should put the copyright symbol on things you send out or when you send an email to somebody, you might have that copyright symbol in the in the cover letter just so people know that you're you're not an idiot and that you've protected yourself and so that they might think twice yeah but it's just like if you're submitting a script 
for film or TV, you know, when you go meet with agents or producers, directors, you, you give somebody a treatment, they could just take that idea and just put a new twist on it. And you'll, you, I hear a lot more of that kind of stuff going right. on, really. But I mean, if you go in and you have, you know, copyright, and maybe even if you have a manager or a lawyer's name, you put on submissions as or CC people. I think people might be less likely because they're like, oh, these people are professional and they're they're wise to this. I don't think that um, people on the film and TV side, the music supervisors or somebody working on a, a TV show, whether it's a, a real a low budge reality show or a big broadcast network hit, I don't think they're sitting there waiting for some unsuspecting musician to send in music that they can go, all right, we got a free one, let's steal it. Uh, I think it's much more likely that somebody will forget to enter it on the cue sheet, yeah. and then you'd have to go to ASCAP or BMI or CSAC, whoever your PRO is, and go, look, you know, here, here's my song, and here's a video of, of the song in the show, and hope that your PRO will go to battle for you to collect the money. But I don't think... Uh, the record world is different. I've always contended that if you're an A&R guy... I'm coming to have lunch with you, and you invite me to be there at noon. I show up five minutes early. You're listening to a song from another client, mm -hmm. um, or maybe not a client yet. And I hear that song. It's completely understandable or believable to me that three years later, I'm writing a song, and a melody and a rhythm pop into my head. It could have been you know, completely unintentional because I heard it in your office. It could have, wouldn't that be very, that would be very hard to prove the yeah. connection to, but I did have this happen, and I don't want to mention the name of the artist or the song, because it's a very famous song, but I have a somebody I'm repping now, an unknown writer, was working in a studio, and they did write a hook and submitted it to a big artist, mm -hmm. who's repped and has a big a and r for, and these people are all reputable people, I know them. Uh, well, for whatever reason, this guy's name didn't get added to the copyright, number one song on Billboard. Um, but he was he had the original master that he did and was able to prove that you know he submitted it and he had an original version and the hook was there and it was undeniable and they gave him his credit they gave him his credit Great. after the fact but he had to like chase them around because he was an unknown and sometimes I don't know if it was intentional or unintentional his name just got left off you well, know because it was one of those things with the multiple writers right, and, six you know, writers on one song yeah and he just kind of got squeezed out and and, and that's why. You know, it's it's good to have representation and hopefully a publisher or somebody in your side on your side to kind of like stay on top of things like that. But when you're a new writer, sometimes you don't. And if it's just a song that's going to get you, you know, a no sync fee deal and be placed in a reality show, and yes, you can make money, decent money off the back end, depending on how often the show repeats. It still probably won't add up to what a lawyer would cost you to even threaten litigation. I'm guessing. Prop. Probably not. That's and that's yeah. That's just the reality of it, yeah. right? <laughs> Sad reality, but reality. Um, question for a singer songwriter who hasn't done any production on their songs, and these are at the moment only pure a cappella without any piano or guitar, only vocals, lyrics, and melody. Is it a good idea to put any videos out there showing your talent to get exposure prior uh, prior to production? and also without having these registered somewhere? Uh, well, I guess that's a two-parted question. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in getting your music out and exposing it to the mm -hmm. world, because then you know, things go viral these days on YouTube, whatever. You could have a hit, become a superstar. But I, but I don't think that's going to happen if you put out an inferior product. Right. I mean, I really think it has to sound good and, and competitive. So, and, and actually, I just went to a, an event that Scooter Braun spoke on who's Justin Bieber's manager and he discovered Justin Bieber on YouTube mm -hmm. and he was actually looking at another singer another teen singer but you know you have on, on the side right. these are, and he ended up going through he was trying to find a, a pop you know teen singer and he found Justin way deep, deep down there um, but and then he, when he hit Justin's thing he saw that he had many many other cover videos and a lot of views so mm -hmm. that's what piqued his interest to further investigate that so that would never have happened if Justin Bieber hadn't put out multiple videos and it was just him doing covers at home but they sounded good enough i guess but you, you know was he doing them with a track or some he was doing he was, to, yeah he was doing it he would be you know there would be like a like a aretha franklin respect mm -hmm. track with her vocal not on and he would just sing over it that's how he was doing it because he was only 12 <laughs> or 13 at the wow. time but it was good enough that that you know maybe scooter braun was a little more informal about what he's looking for but i think some a r people get a little spoiled about the level um, but, but that's, that's what I, you know, I, 
I think you should put stuff out, but if it's really, really raw and lo-fi and stripped down and it's not your best effort, you right. may want to Don't think make a twice bad of, first impression. Yeah, you may want to think twice about that. But it, but anyway, I, I, I think it's good to have stuff out. As far as protecting it, it goes back to what we talked about before. I mean, is it is it worth it to, to spend the money to to copyright every little thing you do at, the, at an early stage? I, I mean, in a perfect world, you should. Because you're exploiting it and it's yours, but if you're doing covers, by the way, you wouldn't. But if it's an original tune, um, you know, I think you probably should should try to protect yourself if you can. Because if you're putting your stuff online, I would think you're doing it. It's a professional move that you're making. You're trying to get exposure. You're somebody. You want somebody to find out about you. So, to me, that's that's just like distributing your music or trying to sell your music. And it's interesting because. People will put stuff out in all kinds of raw forms because they, they want to share it. But you're right. I, I think that that could be a bad move because it, it, it makes a bad first impression. And But don't wait but, forever either because yeah. you can be a per, 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 perfectionist and then you never get anything out. And not, right. you know, So there's a fine line. And I'm not an artist, so I don't know when, when you like shoot your shot on that. But I, And sometimes it's good to have outside people maybe that you can trust to say, you know, it's good, get it out, it's good. That's why managers are helpful sometimes, because they're like, yeah, yeah it because, sounds good now, but if you don't have that and you're your own judge all the time, sometimes it's hard to know, right? It's tough to get a good manager, though, unless <laughs> you've is. got a label that already wants you, a, a real manager that's experienced, doesn't want to represent you. Well, just maybe if you're an artist, but, you know, there's communities of other other artists you can trust, other musicians, other producers, other writers that... The taxi I mean, you trust forum. Them, yeah, we've, you can, we've got a peer to peer section. Yeah. Where it's I mean, exactly, somebody you trust, you might just go to them and say, "Hey, is this? Do you think this is good enough?" Um, when working with a producer, you don't know who wants to hear your songs and record an acoustic demo. Is there some kind of waiver or small agreement that protects your song if it's pre copyright? Well, that's a good question. So you're trying to get a producer interested in working with you. And they say, well, let me hear what you got, kid. And you're, you know, they want you to play in the stuff uh, in a guitar vocal form. This person's worried that they're going to jack their music. Uh, is there any sort of like oh, well, way to protect yourself? You know, you could, you could ask people. This has just been my experience with successful directors, producers, and both film and music. I mean, it's like you have to trust people to a certain extent and respect them. They're their status status in the business. So if they're going to give you an audience and listen to your, you don't want to be hitting them with something, being saying you have to sign this disclosure or waiver <laughs> that you're not going to steal my music. It's going to set the wrong tone. Like a prenup for, on the first yeah, day. Yeah, it sets the wrong tone. So I, I to me, I, you know, again, it comes, it goes back to if you're going to play stuff for people, you know, you can have your copyright. If you're going to give them a CD, you could put the C in the circle. If you're going to MP3 it in the cover letter or some stamp on, on it and, and the metadata that's a copyright symbol there. So people know you're wise to that and you've, you've protected yourself or you give the appearance that you have. But, I, you know, if you're just playing things, this is just my experience and my, my opinion. I don't think you should be forcing that kind of paperwork on people. Now, if it's somebody that's a snake and has a reputation of being a thief, I, you shouldn't meet with them anyway. But right. if you are and you're less concerned about your long-term relationship with them, then maybe you go in and say, listen, I need you to sign this first. Just, say, you know, agreeing that I own all these rights and you're just listening. And, you know, again, I don't, I don't quite know how you're going to draft something like that. But it, and sometimes it's called like a non-disclosure thing. They're keeping it confidential. And, um, you know, it's... It's not as easy as it sounds to draft something like that because there's d several different ways it could be and formatted. And if, if they're you know, skanky enough that you've got to hit them with that form <laughs> on a first date, do you really want to be in the well, meeting? Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, well taken. I, yeah, I just think if you're going to meet with the head of A&R for Atlantic Records or, and, right. or some big producer, Timbaland, you're going to play them some music, you know, if, you, if they're going to get really turned off if you hit them with that because they're going to think, they're going to be, be offended by it, think that you don't trust them. You know, whether you should or you shouldn't, that's just the, the mentality. And, and it might just set the wrong tone and they just shut you down. Musicians seem to ha be predisposed because of what they've heard from other musicians for decades now. Everybody out in the, in everybody in the industry is out to rip you off. We hear this from uh, really reputable companies that we forward our members' music to on a very regular basis that the companies will reach out to the taxi members and say, I'm, I'm interested in signing your song into my catalog. The members will not get back to them. I call the members up. Why didn't you get back to this company? They're like a gold-plated company. 
I was afraid they'd rip me off. So you've waited your whole life to get this opportunity, and now you're not going to take advantage of it because you're afraid of getting ripped off. They don't even bother to call taxi and say, this is company on the up and up. Blows my mind. Yeah, but just think about it. In that in that instance, you you have a copy of the music that's being submitted, right? right. That the artist does that can put it some kind of date stamp on it. So yeah. they've or, there's already ways to prove that that you that it's yours. Yeah. So I don't understand what the hesitation is. And there. we keep backups of our database forever. We've got backups going back to 1992. Okay. So you so if so. you had to, you could go back and prove yeah. your, your case. So. Again, I, mean, I don't know who's listening or if that if you have people out there that, that are hesitant, but I don't, I don't think you should be so hesitant about things like that. I agree. Um, let's see. If I co-write 50-50 on the songwriting credit and I own a publishing entity, is it wrong to claim 100% of the publishing since they don't own the publishing entity. That's interesting. 50-50 yeah. writer, but you own a publishing entity, do you automatically no. get it? No, you only, if you wrote 50% of the song, you only own 50% of the publishing, unless that other writer wants to assign. Their, they don't have to form their own publishing company to own their publishing. Right. They still own their 50% share of the publishing. So they would have to assign that. You just can't automatically grab theirs <laughs> just because you have an official publishing company. So no, you can't do that. There would have to be a written transfer from the other party to you and you could do that yeah maybe you know the other party might say i want you to be my publisher i want you to be my administrator but that would have to be in writing so that just can't be assumed how much is a typical administration deal what does the administrator get T tell them what an administrator does and what an administrator gets percentage wise for performing that duty oh, well task. i mean a traditional administrator in my experience all they do is is do administrative things. They'll register the copyright, they'll register with the PROs, and then they'll collect the income when the song is exploited on TV or it's mechanical royalty if it's, if it's recorded, um, TV, radio, they collect the income because you, as a writer, don't don't know how to do it. You don't. Do they go as far as chasing the dollars down? Yeah, they're, it, well, they're it, supposed to. They're it, supposed to. If, if they hear if that song was used in an indie movie yeah, in they're France, supposed to. that they're, they're supposed to. Yeah, they're supposed to. They're supposed to. But what what I found that they don't do most of the times they don't pitch the right. music. So, but and so in an under traditional uh, admin deal, it, it, anywhere from ten to twenty percent is is an average administration fee out of the hundred percent that comes in, and they don't own anything. Mm -hmm. They just get a percentage to represent the song. And it's usually for a couple of years. It's usually not for forever. It can keep rolling over. And they take 10 or 15% for that. Now, some administrators do also say they exploit the music, too, mm -hmm. or offer that. And if so, if they get a placement, they'll get, like, say they get a placement with film and TV, that would go up to maybe 25 or 30% okay. because they got the placement. Or maybe even all the way up to 50 because they got the placement. And they mm -hmm. also would, would collect on that, too. But most of them don't do that. They wouldn't take any more ownership of the copyright. Mm -hmm. They just get a bigger fee yeah, as, bigger fee, as bigger if fee. they were the yeah, publisher because they performed the full yeah. publishing task rather than just... That's right. They got it. They got it. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some weird hybrid deals where if they got a placement, they all of a sudden own a piece of the copyright. That would have to be something that's negotiable. But, but most of the time, just the, the income percentage goes up. I've noticed, and I'm asking this on behalf of the members because I know this question will get asked sooner or later that many of the members who sign with production music libraries or music licensing, uh, film and TV music licensing specific companies, that the deals are pretty etched in stone. They're, because they're dealing in volume and they may have five, 10, 20, 50,000 pieces of music in a catalog. They're not gonna start negotiating with every writer that they work with. It's basically, here's our deal, take it or leave it. Um, would you advise, as a music attorney, in the beginning, if you know the company is reputable, you've got friends that have done business with them, if the company is coming through taxi, you could call us and find out, you know, how long has this company been around, check them out on the internet. You know the company's reputable. So do you recommend they just go with that deal because it's just a song or a few songs, and then maybe at some point, if they become kind of a superstar in that catalog, that they can negotiate a better or different deal? Uh, well, as a lawyer, I, I, I usually 
would advise somebody to have somebody that's knowledgeable look at the paper mm -hmm. before you sign it. Not necessarily yeah. to say you got to make a lot of changes, but just so they can explain what it's all about, what it means, what the consequences are. And by the way, I've never seen a deal that couldn't be tweaked a little bit or at least had some, some suggested changes. And I've found even in the cases you're saying where you've got people with take it or leave it kind of deals, sometimes if you ask for a few reasonable changes, They'll make them. They just don't want a whole laundry list of things. Um, that, but that being said, if you're brand new and you don't have anything going on, you you know you sometimes you don't want to rock the boat. So, and if it's a reputable company, you haven't heard anything bad, and you have friends that did the deal, it, it's probably not the end of the world just to sign it. But you should always limit it. And you mentioned it to us. Just a limited number of songs right. at first, and test the water, see how it goes. Yeah, don't give me a whole catalog. Yeah, because that you know. Because even if you can't renegotiate on those songs, at least you didn't give away the farm. And as you go along, if even if you work with them more, maybe you can get a better deal down the line, or at least you're free to go somewhere else if it doesn't work out. And again, I, I don't know what those deals are, but if they don't place your music, you should always get your songs back. And sometimes that's not built into those deals. Right. There's not an automatic reversion if they don't place it. So, a lot of libraries want stuff in, in you know, an but then exclusive they, but, deal but, in perpetuity. Yeah, but then they don't. Then they sit on it and nothing happens, and that's not fair to the writer if there's no action on it. I, I would contend, and uh, I'm only playing devil's advocate. This isn't... Especially me. if it's exclusive. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I would say I'm playing the role here of an exclusive library that wants stuff in perpetuity for the reasons I mentioned earlier. They can't call stuff back. Um Oh, I lost my train of thought. I, I um, honestly, I don't see the argument for them keeping it forever if they never get any action on the song. I'm, I just don't. Uh, oh, here, here's what I was going to say is libraries don't often, it's not like the old days of publishing where they had pluggers. You know, you signed with Warner Chapel and they had a creative team that found the, the writers and helped them develop their music. And then you had pluggers that would get out there and hustle the stuff. In the film and TV world, it's more about getting a phone call from a music supervisor. Hey, do you guys have any of this or that? Mm -hmm. So you're plugging it on demand. It's not just pushing it, it's pulling. So I think it's completely believable that, that a library could get very excited about something you've got, and the occasion never arises where they get asked for that thing, although most libraries would be... Uh, hesitant to sign something they don't think there's a possibility of, of getting placed. Or it could be that they've um, responded to those searches 50 times over a period of two years and never once, it was always the bridesmaid, never the bride. <laughs> so I don't feel like it, it, it's equitable to compare them to a Warner Chapel or a Sony or Universal Music Publishing where they've got pluggers. However, I as an artist or as a writer would want to get my copyright back because maybe somebody else would have more luck so well, well only this is this is how we support ourselves right? yeah. we need to get some action and some money or yeah. we can't eat or support the family so at some point whether it's five or ten years yeah i, I think it should come back i really do that's just me and i found most of I, them I, will I agree at it. some point but you can't pull it back right away that's not fair either you know you got to right. give them a shot and it might take many years. It might take many yeah. years. We've seen a lot of cases where a song has gone to a library. Uh, we just had one recently where uh, six years after the song was forwarded from Taxi that it finally ended up in a TV show. Okay. Six years. Uh, well, and it, by the way, it's, I think it should be the option to revert to because if, if the writer can see that the publisher's trying, mm -hmm. then they feel good about that. It's just when it sits there and is collecting dust. You know, nothing. No pitches, no calls, nothing. Yeah. Know, nothing. Then, I don't then, know that the libraries are going to report all the times well, that they pitch it. I don't know them. either. I don't I don't know how that works in reality, and especially if it's people do, like, you know, some of these things, it's just in a database, yeah. and people are searching. I don't know how they track that or if they have a counter on it or whatever. They probably should. So, you know, transparency is a big deal these days because of the Internet. I mean, if your music's with somebody, you should be able, in a perfect world, to go online and see... Has there been any activity? Has anybody looked, listened? Has it been licensed? Is there any money in the pot? You know, they really should be setting these kind of... And some of, the, some of these publishers have it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Transparency? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's... That way, at least you can see if anything's going on. Because, other, uh, yeah, it's not... Because they may not be keeping, like, a regular log because they don't have a pitching person as to 
it was sent to this person on this date and a follow-up call on this date and we had lunch on this date and this you know it's yeah, you're not going to see that kind they're, of they're dealing in such volume yeah, that i don't think see that, that. <laughs> yeah um this one's come up a couple times today. It's poor man's copywriter, more recently, the iPhone recording voice memo stand up in court. Uh, if you have proof that you wrote a song, is it not a matter of who wrote the song, but who wrote it first? Correct. Um, let's, let's just whittle it down to the poor man's copyright in, in whatever form you do it, whether you mail it to yourself in an envelope that you never open or you do some sort of date stamp with your iphone does that mm. does well it's that just, hold up well it's it's evidence remember it's up to a judge to decide these things mm -hmm. so you know if if you haven't registered it if you register with the copyright office you have um you have the presumption is with you that you have the copyright because you filed it before anybody else did but by the way you could file a copyright and you still ripped it off from somebody or you know or somebody used it before you did that could prove with what you're talking about they could come pull out the poor man's copyright or some old tape pre-existing that pre-existing the date so it's it always comes down to a judge making the decision so I, but it's not a foolproof method that's why it's most people would say hey you know if you're serious about it you should register it because that's the best proof but even that's not foolproof you know but right. the poor man's copyright the thing is i myself have steamed a letter open to see if it could be done and, and then resealed <laughs> it and you can't tell the difference and judges know that yeah. some some thief out there could figure that out. So that's why I'm saying, that's why it's not that's why it's not a foolproof method. Because, Remember this, folks. The law yeah. offices of McLean and this Long. Was, this they, was, they, they well, this was this was when I was in college. <laughs> but I know it can be done if you're sneaky and you want to do it. You can do it. Yeah. Okay. So and but but again, all this you know date stamps on vocal tapes. If there's a date stamp on it, that's that's evidence yeah. that would be considered by a judge if there's a dispute, right? That's, that's how it works. I had a guy call me up. He, uh, he was an old client of mine from back in my studio days, and he joined Taxi like 35 years later. And he called up probably six months into his membership and was livid that there was a Tim McGraw song on the radio, and Taxi must have forwarded his song to Tim McGraw, and he ripped him off. And I'm going to, you know, sue your ass, Lasco. I mean, sue your butt, Lasco. And, uh, the first thing I did was go on ASCAP or BMI or wherever and, and check the copyright date on the song, and it predated when this guy wrote his song, mm. the the one that Tim McGraw had the hit with. Oh, so it was written by a writer in Nashville who'd written it like seven or eight years before. So okay, so you know, what what did you tell the guy that uh, he wouldn't even take my calls after that? But uh, I mean, there was some similarity. It wasn't substantial. There was like a twenty five thirty percent similarity. You know, right. the the chorus was a similar idea and had a similar melody. It was not identical in any way, shape, or form. But I could see how the guy would go, "Hey, that sounds familiar." Well, they, they I mean, there's certainly similarities, and people get inspired by just like you said. You hear something, and it's in your brain, and then it comes out, and you don't even know it. Yeah, there's been lawsuits about that. I think George Harrison lost that case based Absolutely. on a similar argument. It wasn't exactly the same, but it, he was like, "Man, I didn't even know I did it. It was subconscious." Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> but it, the, the, it was close enough that the judge or the jury award, you know, found against him. My sweet lord, I didn't even know I did it. Yes, <laughs> and the other one that I, I've heard, I've listened to the two is um, I, uh, is Ray Parker Jr. Ghostbusters and Dewey Lewis. Oh, I yeah. want a new drug. I, I, I I've listened to the two of them. They're sort of similar in certain points, but I never really got it. I, I've got to say, I'm right there with you on that one. It's not that incredibly obvious. But but Gray Parker Jr. got sued and lost, and, yeah. and Huey Lewis won that case and proved that it was a ripoff. So I don't know. So those things happen, but you know, and I'm and I don't. Ray Parker Jr. is a good writer, so I, I really don't know if he probably did it subconsciously. I can't imagine he intended to do it. And, and did he have access? To the song you know you're talking earlier about the channel had he actually heard well i think he yeah if it was a hit on the radio he probably you know you could say so it was, it was on, after yeah it was after okay after huey lewis yeah, had not much hit. later though it was oh, around okay. the same era are you aware of any blacklist of writers who have lost copyright cases say so that what uh, are you aware of any blacklist that exists of songwriters who've lost copyright cases no I, I, I don't know of anything. I mean, these days with Google, if you look Google things, if it exists, it's going to be out there in the Internet somewhere. Um, question. 
if you post a new song to SoundCloud and you haven't copyrighted it yet and it's dated and timestamped, would this hold up like the old postal copyright of mailing your song to yourself and never opening it? It's the, it's the same thing we just talked about. It's, it's evidence to pr try and prove your case, but it's not foolproof evidence. And again, it, it, I'm not an attorney. I've got one sitting next to me who, you know, should certainly comment on this if I'm wrong. But you know what, if, if the copyright in dispute is something that's gonna make you $123 over getting played on some show in the History Channel or wherever, versus a mega hit, just eat the 123 buck loss um, because it's gonna cost you so much more, even if you've got a timestamp or a copyright register that proves that it was yours, over a tiny little income, if especially like if it's an instrumental cue, is it a battle worth fighting? Yeah, pro probably not. It, I'm, it's just case by case. Sometimes it's about it's people thumping their chest and wanting to prove a point and make a point or whatever. But you have to be seeing it from this side where you can see how much time and money's lost chasing people around. Yeah, you know, if you've never done it before, it might not seem that daunting, but it really <laughs> is a lot of work. So you have to. Is it worth? The, is it the you know, that time versus benefit? balancing test you know it always is so if, if if you know Beyonce ripped your song off and she's had a number one hit with it and you and you and you can prove substantial similarity in access I think you should go for it mm -hmm. you know um, other than that you really should probably weigh it out and it's it, again there's a whole strata of, of different levels of success and value in songs and once even when something's ripped off at what point you're gonna pull the trigger on it you yeah, when you do that balancing test. Litigation is nothing like it looks on TV. Cases don't get solved in right. an hour. And, e and even when a lawyer's doing it on a contingency, they're not eating the costs usually. Right. You know, if you have to hire witnesses or court reporters or, a hi you know, hire somebody to rent a room to have a big deposition or whatever, that you have to pay for that. The lawyer might not be getting paid. Thousands of yeah, dollars. Yeah, so, so there's still money there that, that the writer's going to have to come up with to chase these things around. Um... Hi, Ben and Michael. I recently ran into a situation where a band claimed that a piece of my band song, specifically a guitar drum intro, sounded like theirs. Uh, admittedly, it does sound similar. Had no way, but it had no way, it had in no way heard. No, I had in no way heard their song prior to writing ours, and everything except that intro verse riff is completely different. Should they be interested in pursuing a suit? Could they have a claim to anything besides a percentage? It d doesn't sound to me like they have a case. I mean, just tell them to you know, just tell them to sue you if they're. <laughs> right. know, it doesn't yeah. sound like they have a case. Find I mean, a lawyer that will will sue you, um, and they won't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they're gonna. They, what again? It goes back to it, what? Are, what's this band gonna sue you for? What's the val? I mean, what's the value of this right. claim? You know, unless you have a big hit, they're not gonna get anything. They should hope you have a big hit. Right. You should both hope you have a big hit. By the way, and there and there's this is going on right now. The forty years later or more, there's Randy California's estate is suing Led Zeppelin on the Stairway to Heaven. The intro oh, yeah. you heard that forty years later. Okay, and it does sound similar. There's why a song the on a spirit. Why didn't the statute of limitations run out? Uh, well, there's only they don't, they filed it in like Vermont or something where the there the statute yeah. is longer or something. They found a state. Um, but anyway, the, if you, there's a song on the very first Spirit record that sent, it's called Taurus, and it does sound like that intro, wow. almost note for note. I, why they didn't sue sooner, I don't know. But it, and the same thing with I just heard "Sweet Child of Mine" over the weekend. There's an Australian band that had a song back in the early '80s, and that that guitar riff that Slash plays, mm -hmm. you know, which is the hook of the song, really sounds very similar. A, and this is again 30 years ago, and this Australian band all of a sudden is suing them. 30 years later almost, <laughs> but it's close enough. It's the, it, We're talking about guitar intros here, right? Yeah. Not the song, but just the guitar intro because it's a big part of the song. So, I mean, again, but both of these songs are massive hits, mm -hmm. made billions of dollars, right? Then it's worth it. Right. Although although there is this thing called statute of limitations, Michael Bry, if you wait too long to pursue your claim, you're barred. Usually it's yeah. a couple of years. It's usually not 30, 40 years. Yeah, I was shocked to hear that. By the way, if you've never heard of the band Spirit, if you're not old like me and you don't know the band Spirit, 
great band. They get very little attention these days. Remember the, the album 12 Dreams of Dr. Sardonicus? Yeah, Mr. Skin. Yeah, that's such a great <laughs> record. You guys got to check it out. The 12 Dreams of Dr. Sardonicus by the band Spirit. Awesome. By the way, and just not to get off the point, but Jay Ferguson, the singer of the band, still does a lot of film and TV composing he does, around uh, town. He does NCIS uh, Los Angeles, the TV show. He's yeah. uh, the He scores that show. Yeah, super nice guy. And when Randy California was alive and Ed Cassidy, the drummer, I worked for both of those guys wow. at different points. Are you old enough? Yeah. Well, you I in... met these guys when I first got in the business. Um in, you know, because they were hanging around Malibu, and so I went to Pepperdine, which was in Malibu. So, yeah. and and Jay, I've also done some work for too. But Jay's just the, su the sweetest guy. You know, really is a great guy. But he's still active. I want to get Jay to come to the road rally and do something on stage with me. Can you introduce yeah, him? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think love... he would come. I actually met him at Criteria back in the seventies. When he... did he do a solo record, Thunder Island? Yeah, Am I remember. That's right. Yeah. Okay. He did some of that at Criteria when I was a puppy. And Shakedown there. Crew. Yeah. <laughs> and I see his name in the NCIS uh, LA credits all the time, and I remember a criteria the moment that I, you know, that brief moment that I met him, he seemed like a very nice, he's just warm same, guy. Yeah, he really, he, he lives in Men Mendocino up yeah. by Santa Barbara. Yeah, and he and he's got a home studio, and he just creates music all day. I believe I'm, I haven't seen him in a while, but wow. Yeah. Uh, okay, question. Uh, let's. Uh, what does a comp question? What does a composer demo and self distribution allowed, but company controls all licensing to media or third parties? So this person is asking what that clause um, means. That the composer demo and self distribution are allowed, but the company, meaning the publisher, controls all licensing to media and third parties. Mm. Uh, well, what I think that means is maybe they're giving an exclusive license for, they call it all media at a lot of these companies, but most of these companies are really pitching to film, TV, advertisements, and video games. Right. They're not trying to get a record deal for you. That's not their world. So they'll make an exclusion or an exception, and they should, to let the artists still sell Put their own music up on iTunes and sell it, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they're or getting, sell CDs at their yeah, sell CDs because really that company has nothing to do with that. So I believe that's what they're talking about because sometimes the language is so broad. It says any and all media, it would include distribution, which means you they would be your exclusive distributor too. But they're really not a distributor. So I think that's saying you as an artist maintain the rights to sell your music on iTunes or at shows physically if you want. I think that's what. Now, okay, let, let's assume that to be the case, that you've signed an exclusive deal, and publishing deal, and they've got 100% of the publisher share, you got 100% of the writer share, they've got the exclusive right to pitch it for film and TV. What happens when you sell, let's say you're out in a touring band and you sell 10,000 copies of your CD or downloads, do you then have to pay that publisher what they would get on the mechanicals? It would be, it, well, it depends how the contract's written. If it says they get, they share in any and all exploitation of the music, that would include selling it. Right. Uh, but again, that's something that is the lawyer, usually that's kind of separate from what they do, and they probably had nothing to do with creating those sales. So it's, it's just an unfair windfall mm -hmm. to the publisher. So, however, they might feel like, hey, the reason you're selling more CDs on the road is because we've been getting you film and TV placements, raising your profile. Which absolutely could so be true. So it's only yeah. fair. So I don't. But again, when I'm repping writers and artists, I'm trying to keep as many rights as they can keep, you know, so that's something you try to ask for. That, that's going to be a case-by-case -case thing. But, but I found most publishers really, I mean, it, it, get lists, it's Warner Chapel and, or something like that. They are trying to get placements, but that's always the, the weird part about when you're a recording artist and you get a publishing deal, a lot of times the only reason you're getting the publishing deal is because the publisher knows you as the artist are recording your own songs right, and they don't have to worry about pitching them to anybody else because it's self-contained. <laughs> so um, They're making a bet your record's going to be a hit and if it is, then they're making yeah, a publishing And then they can just sit back and don't have to ever lift a finger to do anything. <laughs> now, I'm not saying they would do that, but it's happened. So, yeah, you know, that's just keep that in mind if you're doing a publishing deal and that's usually why you try to get a big advance because other, that may be the only Does thing anybody... they're doing is giving you a check. Does anybody get a big advance anymore? 
it's rare, <laughs> but it happens. I mean, we re still I read in Billboard about these million dollar kind of deals, but usually it's because there's been some huge buzz created through something, some kind of activity like, or some big, some big producers attached. Some something's happening, you know, with that artist. Um, for the average, you know, Joe out there who is an indie band in Ohio, and you know, they sell two or 3,000 CDs a year at their shows. They get 100 people out uh, twice a week to shows that they play. And they get some regional airplay. What kind of a deal is a band like that going to get with a major label these days? They, they probably won't. <laughs> they probably, okay. There's probably not enough going on. Um, and especially what, if it's in the rock genre, because unfortunately, let's say it's a rock band. There's no radio for rock right now, traditional rock. It's just, it's all pop and urban and EDM and things like that. So, you know, the labels are kind of shine. Not that rock isn't great for road. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go to rock shows, but for some reason, there's not a lot of radio play. I don't know. It's just not like it was back in the 80s and 70s when there was rock on the radio all the time. And, and so many of the requests that we get from labels who are looking for new acts through Taxi, and I'm sure... Um, through other avenues, the, the same request is made. Please let us know about, um, you know, sales figures you have, um, what kind of people, what numbers of people you're getting out to shows, any big social media success that you've got. I contend that if you're a pop artist with an incredibly unique artistic vibe going on, an amazing voice, and you've got three songs that sound like hit singles, They'll sign you regardless of that other stuff. Am well, I nuts? Or yeah, that? but you said the genre is pop, which is right. Yeah, right. That, that I'm, I think I'm is pushing true. rock. We've already covered rock, so I'm moving yeah, on. Yeah, no, to I pop think now. that's true in pop. And most of these things that are, I mean, if you look in the Billboard top, you'll see lots of new artists coming in you've never heard of before. Right. And it's probably because yeah, they had a, a great song or songs on, um, a lot, you know. But it's so it's still possible, right? But I I think a lot of the A&R people, and I don't want to point any fingers because they're still some good talent scouts but a lot of times i think they're just checking metrics yeah they're, they're all like you know because they don't trust their own instincts anymore like you used to go to you go into the whiskey and you see a band and they blew you away and you're like i've got to work with this band now it's like i'm not sure you know let me make sure that there's fans are responding to this let me see the numbers yeah because so, their boss is going to ask them they might, yeah. you know, but if, if somebody's young, great looking, and they've got charisma, and they've got three songs that they really feel are undeniable hits, and that's an opinion-based thing, mm -hmm. I, I think you have a shot. But there's a lot of other factors. Who's the manager? Who's the producer? Who, you know, is there a scene? Is this an actress, an actor? Are they dating somebody important? All these factors come into play that might not have to do anything to do with the song, but still are factors that are going to come into the marketing and promotion because ultimately you have to market and promote it. Yeah. You know, you can't just stick it on the radio and that's it. There's there's this whole swell of things that go on around it to shore it up. Especially if you've got a TV show, if you've been on Dancing with the Stars or... or well, well you yeah. wouldn't get on there unless you're already a star. Uh, a good example, there's a young lady named Zendaya that was on a Disney show for years. It was a huge hit. Um, she actually went to school with my now 18-year-old daughter and... She got a record deal, I think, with Disney because... Shake you know, it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. she Kid's talented. I mean, she's absolutely a triple threat uh, and, and super good. And, and she came in, I think, number two on Dancing with the Stars. That's a record deal in the making. Who wouldn't want her because she's got millions of fans already versus you or I trying to get a record deal? Um, well, she's going to go to the front of the line yeah. for sure. But, but there are definitely people that are... But I mean, I, when somebody gets signed, I'm still curious too, because I, I try to help people get deals on occasion. I always want to know, like, how did they do it? And then when you peel back the layers, there's usually something going on prior, or somebody's attached to it that knows somebody or is already having some success in the business. Yeah. It's very rare just to come out of Kansas, know nobody, and have a couple songs and all of a sudden you're assigned to Epic Records. I mean, there's just... Unless you're writing undeniable yeah, hits. Yeah. And it, but which has always been kind of where the... You well, know, you have to have the songs, but but it's, but it's the, having those songs always seems to lead to some uh, something else, and then it leads to that, mm -hmm. you know? There's always something to happen in the middle. Explain what a 360 deal is. I think everybody knows the term, right? But not everybody knows exactly what a 360 deal is. Can you put that... In like a paragraph? Yeah. Well, it's and by just like anything else, it's not that black and white, but it, it really means that a record company is is going to participate 
and collect income on every aspect of the artist's entertainment career, anything that touches their career. It's not, you know, it used to be just, if you have a circle here, you got record sales. Okay, that's what labels used to do. They sell records and they they take the money and pay the royalty, and then the the artist was free to do shows, sell their merchandise, write songs. Because they're just licensing your image to go on the record that's and it. licensing that's all they your care music. About. Right? So so there were so all these other things that an artist did in their career in the in the circle of their career, which could be endorsement deals, sponsorship deals, acting, writing books, whatever, cookbook, all that's entertainment career. So it used to be a label didn't care about that. They were selling enough records that they were fine. When the record sales went down with the internet, if they were going to continue to promote the artists and make these other aspects valuable, they wanted to get a piece. So that's why they call it a 360 deal, because it, it usually means they're getting a piece of everything within the artist's career. So, I mean, I'm just drawing a circle because that's yeah. what a 360 is. But, but I mean, you know, but the primary things are going to be merchandising, touring, songwriting and, and record sales and then a anything they call ancillary which is going to be sponsorship deals endorsement deals which aren't going to happen until you're famous acting modeling anything like that they're going to want a little piece of or a big piece of but the, the thing that's negotiable is how big of a piece mm -hmm. are they going to get 10 percent, 5 percent, 30 percent, 50 percent is there a typical range does matt it just depends on the label how much money they're giving you like like disney's you know, historically, we'll take brand new artists, and they want fifty percent because they're building them from the ground up. Right, kids, ground up. You know, um, and they they usually want fifty percent. But it, but again, that's where you have if you have a good lawyer and you have some kind of leverage. Again, if you have some kind of social media presence or some kind of buzz, you have leverage. So maybe you can knock some. Maybe you can knock the publishing out, or maybe you can drop it from fifty to thirty or. 10 even you know drop the percentages down and, and then some labels don't only want to collect the revenue they also want to control it you know in other words they own the merchandising rights oh, and wow. they pay you they own the publishing and they pay you so that's that's even another level of a 360 deal wow <laughs> so it's, so there's an that income participation onerous. and then there's an ownership part of it so so there, there's a couple different levels of that. And it really all depends on who you're signing with, how much money they're giving you, and what you're leveraging. And some of it would be licensing and some would be employment, I guess. If you're an actress and you're working on a Disney show, you're employed by that show. Yes, yeah. But if you're that same actress and you've signed a record deal, you're licensing your performance and your image and your songwriting, if you're the writer, to the label. Right, right. And you have to be careful because sometimes, yeah, it, it can really wrap your career up and you can't. Say you know, say you want to act, and you've given your acting rights to a label, just like they do on these American Idol type shows. Mm -hmm. Everything goes to them, and then they get to decide. You know, if some other film or acting company wants to take you on, they license you out, just like in those old studio systems when actors in the old days, when you worked for MGM, they controlled your career. You couldn't work anywhere else. They'd have right. to loan you out. It'd be the same. That still happens in the record business now, but 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 only if somebody's usually. Get, giving you one of those huge deals, and you're usually, an, uh, you know, and they're they're building it completely from the bottom up, right? You know, because then they have a good argument that they're creating the whole career. Um, let's see. That question I don't understand. Hi, I've produced a ten-track salsa album and signed a distribution agreement in August 2014 with a label based in Arizona. I feel trapped in that contract which label never returned me a signed copy uh, label hasn't done a marketing plus they wrongly upload the tracks to iTunes and Amazon names don't match the songs when consumers buy a song they get another one when I started to complain uh, there's the rest of the question is missing it hasn't been posted yet mm -hmm. when I started to complain comma well, it sounds like they didn't get a good response or any response. Right. Hurry up well, and type the rest. Well, I mean, I can start as to what. Okay. I mean, your options are, it's only been a year. I mean, it's only been a year. Or not even. A, it was October of Yeah, so I don't so it's I mean, been like seven yeah, months. But, but it hasn't, you know, but on the other hand, if they're doing all these screwy things and making all these mistakes, that's not good. Putting other people's names on the music, that's not good, but... I mean, normally in those situations, you just have to write a letter to them. Uh, here we go. When I started to complain, the label said, if you're not happy, 
you can sue me, but you have to come to Arizona. If you want to get out of the contract, you have to pay me all the marketing I've invested in the CD. What would you suggest that I do? Well, fine. I mean, you just said they didn't do any marketing. So, I mean, it, maybe that's not a big check to write. I mean, that, that may... <laughs> listen, you, you know, number one, you said you don't have a written agreement back. You have to have... Both parties have to sign it for there to be a valid contract. However, if they have your signature on file... They could easily countersign it at any time and right. say, but they have to have a fully executed contract or there is no contract. But uh, other than that, I mean, it hasn't been that long yet. So, I, you know, I'm not sure, you know, may, it doesn't sound like it's go headed in the right direction. It doesn't sound like it's ever going to be a fruitful situation. So I would just like, in a nice way, just ask to be let go. And if you have to give, pay them something or give them something to go away, Sometimes you have to do that. I mean, you know, it's not a perfect world out there. <laughs> Michael, yeah, it's, it's, it's rarely a perfect world, if ever. Michael, I want to work with more singers to sing on my songs. I cannot afford to always pay up front, uh, work for higher fees for the amount of songs I want to produce. So how else can I pay the singers out of the song? Um, I want to take care of singers. So he's asking... I, I want to work with a bunch of different singers. I can't afford to pay them cash up front. Um, can I pay them on the if come, assuming and you know, assuming he gets the stuff licensed in a TV show or whatever? Yeah. Well, you can, but you're going to have to have an agreement saying they get a percentage of um, your net profits, for instance, because mm -hmm. you're going to sell records, license the music to film and TV, for instance, and you're going to make X amount of money, depending on how many people there are that are session players. You know, out of that pool of money you get as your your share, you could agree to slice a piece off on the back end, and then then you'd have to pay a royalty to these people. But then you're talking: do you pay them out of net or well, out of gross? Well, usually out of net, yeah, because otherwise, you, you know, you have to spend money to market promote. I mean, I, right? But then you're opening yourself up to them looking at your net, going, "Well, I don't think you should well, spend all this money." But on they mixing. have to. But that's why you put a you have to put in the agreement. You're allowed to spend X amount of money before you get to, to the net. I, but I'm this. I mean, if you're not going to pay them up front, you have to have some kind of back. You don't want to leave it open for discussion, right? You know? But but it also sometimes just crediting people that a certain way is important to them, or or, or may. I mean, my always my advice is really just if you can, because it's a pain to have to account to people in the back end. Because if you forget mm -hmm. or you do it wrong and get audited, you could get sued. People chase you, harass you. Just try to like pay people something. <laughs> And just get them to sign off on it, you know. So, you know, and, and obviously you credit people. You know, if this isn't a big budget situation, a lot of people are going to do it. But you know, they just want it some fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, right? Pay them because to not pay them, it, it really can be a hassle. Because then you got to work out all these deals about giving them a piece on the back end, and then you have to actually follow through and do it, and which then, is a lot of work. And they're going to show it to their brother's best man's wife's <laughs> uncle. And they're always going to think you screwed them. Right, who's a music, so-called music attorney in Ohio that took two music law courses when he went to, you know, got his law degree, and it, it's going to be a lot of brain yeah. damage, right? Yeah, but I, I know, hey, listen, no, nobody has a lot of money, but if, you, if you're going to make a project, you know, try if you can, try to budget something to pay these people on the front end. That's the better way to do it. It's cleaner. You know, but, but and I think anybody that works with you in, a, in any project is going to realize there's not a lot of money there and hopefully there's some other you have some kind of but you know the credit's really important for most people they want that credit mm -hmm. you know because that's what gets them their next gig um somebody mentioned i gotta scroll up hopefully sometimes when i scroll this thing gets really funky but somebody just mentioned e and o insurance uh e and o insurance a uh, hypothetical situation you've written a song that to the best of your knowledge is 100 percent original but it's awfully catchy and there are only 12 notes <laughs> Will asking your publisher for E and O insurance make you look bad, or should you just form an LLC? So, in other words, I accidentally write something that's going to get me sued in a copyright infringement suit. Should I be only signing with publishers who have E and O, which is errors and omissions insurance, or should I um, form an LLC or a corporation to uh, protect myself mm. as the writer. Good, a good question. I mean, I've never asked a publisher personally if they had e insurance. I'm assuming the big ones probably do have some kind of insurance policy to protect against infringement claims. The smaller ones, 
probably the, don't. The mid-sized production music libraries that provide stuff for film and TV generally have E&O insurance. A lot of the smaller ones do not, although I've seen more and more people stepping up and getting it. Okay. So I think if I was running a company and I, had, I was using a lot of music from strange people not knowing, <laughs> I would probably Not get, that you guys are strange people. Well, it's just strange yours, and right. you don't you don't know if, the, if they're saying it's their own song. You don't know. Right. You know, you're relying on that. I think exactly. they, they probably would... Most of them probably have it, but I think from the writer's perspective, if you again, you know, if you're going to form an LLC, it's better because that protects you against any personal liability. That's why you do it. But remember, when you form an LLC, there's a cost to set it up, and you have to pay minimum tax every year in California. It's eight hundred dollars a year just to keep it open. Yeah. And then after that, it's based on your growth, so it can be very expensive to keep an LLC open. So you have to. You know, you might end up spend more money keeping it open than you ever make from your career. So I, I have again, it goes back to this infringement stuff that we. It's so rare, it's so rare. I think people overthink it. Uh, I think that's true. People do overthink it. I think that a lot of these things get settled without even lawyers getting involved. Uh, and this is just on the film and TV side. But I've heard of plenty of cases where. Um, it, it's a few phone calls and a few nasty threats. And somebody writes a check and it goes away. Although I'm not an attorney and I can't get <laughs> well. Sometimes, the... sometimes that's 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 how you settle a matter. It's better to write a check to somebody and get it off your plate than to go through the whole litigation process or keep hiring lawyers to battle it out for you. It's just sometimes it's a nuisance suit. You don't even know if they're right or wrong. You're just getting them off your back, or you yeah. know they're right, and it's just like this could escalate. Let's just fix it now. You know. And by the way, they, they did that. I don't know what really happened, but in that Sam Smith mm -hmm. song, you know, I'm sh Tom Petty and, and Jeff Lynn made a claim and a good claim, and they settled that right away. They don't, nobody wanted to fight about it, and I think that just happened with the Bruno Mars thing, too. You know, I don't know what that one's about, but some writers came out, and obviously it was undeniable that they were writers, and they just instead of fighting it, they're like, "Here's your piece, you know, right. here's your piece of the song." Uh how do you know, and I know you're going to be, um, how do you know if you've got a good or the right music attorney? Because so many times that I've had people call me and say, I've had a music attorney look at this contract from a publisher. Turns out that 90% of the time or greater, the music attorney is not somebody that is a, a full-time attorney such as yourself. I know you, I know a dozen other attorneys, all of whom I, I know to be the real guys that are out in the trenches every day. But when somebody tells me they've got a music attorney from Kentucky, I have to doubt the veracity of that claim. How do these folks know when they're hiring an attorney for something that they've got somebody who is the right attorney? What, what do they look for? What well, are the bullet points? Well, I Again, we talked about Google. You can Google somebody these days and find out what their experience and background is. And if you see that they've done tons of music, and that's primarily what they do. And by the way, most people don't do 100% of anything. Right. It's really hard to survive that way. We mostly do it, by the way. But again, and, uh, you know, and you just look at the history and you talk. I think you should always talk to somebody before and ask them questions. I know I get calls and I, get, I have to audition for clients all the time, you know. You have to tell them what your background is. And I think an honest lawyer would tell you, listen, I don't do that very much. I don't know that much about it. You Did know? you just say the words honest yeah, lawyer? Yeah, I think, I think most <laughs> lawyers are ethical or should be forthcoming sure. about that and would, would tell you. Would tell you. I mean, I've, I've passed up a lot of work because I don't know. I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer, divorce lawyer. I, don't, I refer that out because I, I know I'm yeah. not going to do a good job. I so I don't, you know... Do your research, and obviously, if you refer to them by somebody you trust that's in music, they've had a good experience. I think that's a that's usually a, you know if you get a good referral from somebody you trust, that's helpful. But it's so easy to research people's history now, or even if you know if something bad happened or they had some you know Yelp complaints or whatever, it's mm -hmm. out there, you know. And then then before you hire somebody, I think you should you know I no, they're not going to take it the wrong way if you ask a few questions, pointed questions about. Do you know this? What's your experience with this? Maybe even ask a few questions about how they'd handle something. And, you know, most are, you, nobody's going to give away the farm, but I think they would give you enough information where you could feel good about it. But because it costs money to hire a lawyer, we don't work for free. So, you know, you really want to feel good about <laughs> you don't who work you're working. For no, you want, you want to feel good about who you're hiring and, 
So I, I don't know if there's a, an easy answer for that other than referrals, research. What's the typical range of hourly fees for music attorneys that would be good attorneys? Probably two fifty an hour to five hundred an hour. Okay. Yeah, I've seen it, and it's a little lower and a little higher depending on somebody's brand new or how established and what kind of superstars they. Will. I mean, I see some lawyers that are seven hundred fifty to a thousand dollars an hour, and they're getting it. I don't know where they're getting it from, but I think they're they're repping you know superstars. Yeah. Or big 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 companies. You know, yeah. but most people are around the three hundred range, three to four hundred range. What if they're experienced. Uh, uh, yeah, and, like and by a, the way, and that's hourly. Some do it on flat fee. Some might do it on a contingency, maybe. You know, we do various type of hybrid things. But on, strictly on an hourly basis, that's kind of what you're looking at with experienced lawyers. And what can these guys expect if they get presented with a question, uh, I mean, with a contract from a production music library, and they come to you and say, Ben, I need you to look over this deal and tell me if it's good, bad, or indifferent. How long might that take? What might it cost them for uh, what I'm guessing would be like a two or three page music library deal? Well, minimum a couple, minimum an hour of time. I mean, you know, I again, it, it, there's a lot of factors. If, if it's somebody that's completely broke, it's an indie situation, there's no advance, and it may be somebody that I really want to develop a relationship with, I'm not going to be that stressed about the fee and how much. I'd want to get something, but it might just be a minimum. Mm -hmm. and, and then, or a flat fee or whatever. And, and then, but obviously if it's something that's going to be 60 to 100 pages and there's a big advance involved and there's a lot of work involved, the fee's going to go up. Or sometimes it can be built, maybe the other side can pay it. You know, I mean, if, yeah. if sometimes the other side, if they want to sign an artist, they know they have to have, a, the artist has to hire a lawyer. Excuse me, but they don't have any money. The, the, the record company or publisher might build a lawyer fee into the deal just to yeah this was you're talking not a production music library deal no no like not a, one of those but atlantic records wants to sign yeah. a band and the band has nothing other than the advance they're getting which might be in the 50 to 100 thousand dollar range these days yeah some yeah if you're lucky so, <laughs> but, yeah. but you're right back to that if it's just but there's two but a lot of times people come to me and they just say hey i just want you to read this mm -hmm. and tell me what you think and then some people want me to read it and then also negotiate it which is doubling the time basically mm -hmm. You know, so it really depends. So, but you know, you're you know, you're looking at a couple hundred minimum, I, no matter who you're talking to, right. and it could go up from there. You know, but we, we try to keep our fees fair, just because I'm trying to build relationships with with people. You know, you hope that they'll come back again and again. Uh, here's a question from Jesse J. Peck: How much to keep you on retainer? Well, it, again, it depends. I mean, retainers for me and anybody is based on how much time we think you're going to need us for every month. A retainer usually means a monthly. You pay a lawyer a certain monthly a, a fee, and they're available 24/7 basically to to do work for you. <laughs> yeah. You know, or within reason, or you know, but and and whether that's five hundred dollars a month or five thousand dollars a month, it's going to be based on how much time you think you need them for. So, I mean, some companies need lawyers a lot. If some songwriter might just need a lawyer to look at something one hour a month, the retainer, you know, what's right. the, you know, the retainer's going to be five thousand dollar a year retainer you know, versus so, the five hundred. But usually it's a monthly. Usually it's a monthly thing. But it's really based on what the lawyer anticipates. You know, they're going to be spending because they because it's a capped situation, right? So you know, you can if the so you have to have think some kind of estimate because you don't want to agree to do something for X amount of money and then there's a thousand hours you have to spend on it. Yeah. yeah. That's not fair to the lawyer, so so sometimes it's a little tricky, but um, it, it's a case by case kind of thing. I know that's a wishy washy answer, but that's the only way to it's answer. It's understandable. A uh, question from Brian Kent Thomas: Do publishers' contracts require you to indem indem <laughs> require you to indemnify the publisher for IP infringement? Oh yeah, of course, because again, the the publisher's not the songwriter. So if you're delivering a song, the publisher has to assume or trust that you're giving them an original music, not something that you sampled without permission or stole some music without permission. Because once the publisher puts it out, distributes, puts their name on it, they're in the chain of title to get sued, just like yeah. the writer. You know, so yeah, there's always an indemnity, indemnity in there. There has well, to be. In this day of sampling, uh, I know people that have taken just a snare hit from somebody else's record, and, and they've trimmed the front, and they've trimmed the back, and they've re-EQ'd it, and they've added reverb to it, and they've probably pitched it up a little bit. 
They've done a lot to change it, but it did start out on somebody else's record. If by some act of God, the original owner of that snare beat is able to prove that you, you stole my beat, what kind of money are we talking in a suit like that? Or, or is somebody going to lose their house over that? Or are they going to send them a check for a thousand? Well, it's going to be again. It's going to be based on how much money has been earned on the on the infringement and was it intentional and how uh, much? How it much? Was, was, I'm assuming intent. Okay. And I'm assuming that it was a hit. Okay. And then again, is it how much? Is it just like a little a little snare hit, or is yeah. it an extended? Doom, 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 I'm talking doom, doom, about doom, doom, just a snare you know. hit, just okay. a single. Okay. Well, then beat. that's that's so you know they call that de minimis. By the way, a lot right. of times it's so de minimis that some judges might just say there's not enough there to even to be make a claim. You know? Oh, really? Okay. So, yeah. I mean, there is a de minimis argument, and now that's the argument you hear when somebody says, "Well, I just took a little bit." Just a little bit, you know, and that's why you hear some people say, "Oh, I think you can take four bars or two bars, or and get, you know, I don't know." So where it's these like stealing can... a pack of gum versus walking into a store with a gun, a bank, and, and robbing right. them. Right. Yes. Yes. Five so, grand. so I think that all that comes into play, but um, so again, st steal a pack of gum. Yeah, but I, I don't know. It, it comes down to a judge case by case, and all these other factors as to what the value of a lawsuit's worth. You know, but there are if if you've registered your copyright, there are these statutory damages that are built into the deal based on how many infringements there mm -hmm. are. But again, it's a, a ju you know, but that could make it a hundred million dollar suit if it keeps getting sold and played, and and that judges will usually will will push those damages down because they have the right to do it. You know, because otherwise it could be unfair to to. Make right, it could be pay. a, a three hundred million dollar suit over a drum pad. Yeah, it, and even though technically they could say it's worth that much, but you know it isn't in reality. So, um, somebody just asked, "Can I still ask a question?" Yes, Maddie. Yes, you can. Um, at what point should you start your own indie label? Meaning only if they have a certain amount of original work, like a library of ten songs or forty songs, etc. Um, yeah, well, that's that's I, hard. I mean, because remember, when you run a label, like just like a regular, just think Atlantic Records is a big label with staff and all and lots of overhead and yeah, you know, it's, it costs a lot of money. So if you're going to start an indie label, I don't know what that consists of. Is it just a desk and a computer and a phone? But I mean, are you going to hire staff and you're going to you can get a, rent an office and all you know all these things? You have to. That's the balancing test about you, you don't want to spend more than you make, right? right? So I. I I don't really know. I mean, it depends. If you just have ten songs, I don't really think it's worth it. I if get you, huge catalog, a lot of activity, maybe. What about a, a small publishing company? I get asked this question all the time from you guys. Do I need to start my own publishing company? And I've always told people, if there is no other publisher, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC need a publisher to pay if there's a performance royalty. So the writer's going to get the writer's share. They want to send a separate check to the publisher. So am I correct in saying that you as the writer would register with your PRO and then I'd have to create Lasco Music Publishing as um, another entity so that they could write, that the PRO could write a check to that entity for the publisher side of the performance? Well, my, my experience has been if you haven't formed a publishing company, you, you know, if you're a writer only, mm -hmm. You still own the publisher's share, right? So they redirect it back. Oh, they will to okay. the writer because otherwise they're holding it unfairly. It's it doesn't mean you know it's it's that writer's money. They just haven't formed a publishing. You know, it's, they're paying the same party. Right, it would just be two checks. So they redirect it back. You know, so that that writer will still get a hundred percent of the income. I've had knowledgeable people say to me, "You have to create a publishing company name because they won't send both checks to Michael I, Lasco." But they, but I. It I could think, be yeah, that, that information. Hasn't been, yeah, I, I don't think that's, I really don't think that's, the, I've, I've seen it, the reason I've seen people form publishing companies is because they're very active as writers and, and they, they anticipate doing co-publishing deals down the line, so they want to have a publishing company in place. They want to look more professional because it certainly looks more professional. Does and, anybody, in, oh, go ahead. And, and, and they might even be consider signing other writers to them, and if so, you have to have a publishing company if you want to sign, you actually have to have probably more than one because you have to, if you have a CSAC writer, you have to have a CSAC publishing company. If you want to sign a BMI writer, you have to have a BMI publishing company. But I, I mean, those are, I, I usually the people I see forming publishing companies, they're very busy, they're getting a lot of cuts and they're, and they're doing joint kind of situations with other publishers. So 
they or the they just want to have the perception that they're a real company you know and does anybody buy that i get i know that's one of the reasons i get asked the question and i know that back in the days of cassettes a lot of times uh, uh, and, and cds that people would submit stuff and and it would be you know like uh abc music publishing whatever just some cute little name for a publishing company does any label or any entity in the industry go oh well, they have a publishing company name, therefore I'm more interested in signing them. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm, I'm, it's more of a per, it's more of a of a thing just for yourself to feel good about because okay. you might feel like, oh, I have a publishing company. It, it just makes me feel like I'm more in the business than I'm just a writer. But I, in reality, I don't think it makes so much difference in the in the early stages of your career. And, and remember, when you form a publishing company, even if it's just a DBA, you got to fill out the paperwork to do it properly. You got to get in the system with the government. They're going to tax you. You're going to get, pay licensing fees for your county. Right. You, and then if you run and form an incorporation or an LLC, we already talked about there's fees and minimum yeah. taxes just to keep it open. And then there's the responsibility of something you just mentioned, which is I'm a writer. I'm successful. I'm making 50 grand a year getting placements in film and TV, and you're my buddy. And I think the stuff you've got is good enough that through the channels I've developed, I could get your stuff placed. So I'm going to form Lasco Music Publishing, and I'm going to sign you to it. Don't I have some responsibilities to you? Yeah. And if I fail at those, you could sue my butt? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you certainly have to collect an account. You know, mm -hmm. you collect the money and account back. You're going to have to split. There's, a, you know, 50% or whatever the split's going to be. Yeah, and if you don't and you're, you're sloppy with your books, sure. And, okay. and say you don't. This person doesn't think you properly exploited or you spent the proper time to pitch it. You know, because there's implied obligations when you sign a contract. Even if it's not written, there's an implied obligation to use your best efforts to do whatever the, the traditionally a publisher does, if it's a publishing deal, which is pitch the music, try to create revenue streams. So, yeah. you know, it's, you're right. So there's, there's all these things that, not that anybody's really going to sue you, but they could, you know. So you, you have to take it seriously if you're going to do it. Because we've had taxi members that have done well for themselves and they've started their own small publishing company because they now have legitimate channels to pitch the music. But I've often wondered, do they have channels to collect the money? If something goes international, like it's a lot harder to chase that money. Yeah, they have to, you have to, then you have to get an, an administrator, a sub publisher, or a sub administrator that mm -hmm. does have the connections, the tentacles overseas in particular. You have to, otherwise yeah. you're losing. And these days, you know, the U.S. is 30%. And the rest of the world is 70, and anything, especially with the internet, can go global. And a lot of things do. So uh, the 30 and 70 means 30% uh, of the US. revenue is coming from the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. And 70%, yeah. wow. That's kind of the split. I mean, it could vary, but that's, that's the way I look at it. So, I mean, you know, you have to think globally these days. Um, Okay, Juliet uh, is saying that BMI charges 150 bucks a year to set up a publishing company, but it, uh, it's not necessary to have a BMI. They will direct the, the funds back to you as a writer. Um, am I personally liable if my song is considered a ripoff but makes me no money? Yeah, you're still... You, you, again, if you didn't make any money, then they didn't make any money either. Uh, I, I mean, you didn't. You mean, yeah. If you rip somebody off and you still stole their music, so it's still an infringement, especially if it's intentional. But what's it really worth? Is anybody right. gonna sue you? You know, and then it's like trying to get blood out of a stone. You could win a big case against somebody, but if you, they can't get any money out of them, what's the point? So, <laughs> I, I mean, are the keys to my car. Yeah, but but it's still not. It's not a, an excuse just to steal somebody's music just because you're not gonna make any money. Mm -hmm. Here's one from Richard Emmett, in case you didn't see his question earlier. Scenario. Uh, you've written an instrumental piece. Later you work with a lyricist and turn it into a song as equal co-writers. It's a good question. Is there a standard approach regarding whether the lyricist would or should have any rights to income derived from the original instrumental version? So it only becomes a, a co-write when the lyric is added by the vocalist. And they've co they've co written because they contributed. That's a great question. Do they collect from the instrumental version at that point? It, uh, well, it really. I mean, it, usually the parties agree that um, that it's just going to become a combined copyright. Mm -hmm. 
and at that point onward, if that's what's making the money, you share the money equally regardless if it's on the instrumental side or the lyrics. It's like a ball of wax. You can't separate it. However, if you have a pre-existing piece of music mm -hmm. and then the lyrics are added later and the intent was to keep them separate, then and, and that was in writing when you guys did the joint thing. Yes, you could keep that income stream separate just on the instrumental. It's a but, but, a but, it goes, up. but it goes back to you might only be making music on the instrumental because of the value that was created from the joint work, making Ooh. the instrumental valuable so this person might not think that's And this fair. is why there are litigators, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but normally, once you combine those things, you can't separate the two. Um, do you get publishing rights on a reimagined cover version of a hit song? Um, every I, did, I didn't know what you meant by reimagined. Could you explain? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Reimagined version is like somewhere over the rainbow. Um, you know, the I can't remember the, the guy's name. Did the ukulele version oh, of what? it. Uh, the Hawaiian. Yeah, yeah, I can't even pronounce his name, but we all know who I'm talking about, right? And somebody will put it yeah, in the chat great room voice, for us. Great yeah, voice. amazing version of it. Um, I've been told that for a retooling, if you will, of a song, now you've still got the original lyric and you've still got the original melody. Um, but I've been told, and I don't know if this is right or not, that's why I wanted to ask you, that people will allow you to get paid because you've done an original arrangement. Uh, well, that's, that's usually, well, if a song is still not in public domain, right. and it's still, you have to get permission from the publisher, and they might agree to give you something because you made it so great, but it's totally uh, up to them. If okay. it's a public domain work that's old, right. you can do a new version and you can claim that it's almost like a new copyright and, and you can get paid a certain percentage based on the arrangement. And by the way, BMI and ASCAP have a formula for that. They've got a formula yeah, for yeah. everything. For rearrangement <laughs> rearranging public a public work I mean a, right, a public, public domain. domain song. But not if it's still if it's still a, a, a copyright that's in existence, you have to get permission. You just can't start adding saying, well, I made it better in my opinion, so I, I can get paid on this. Or <laughs> so add. I think that's where the confusion yeah. comes from. You're going to have to People that have suggested this to me are confusing PD stuff with uh, existing current copyrights. Yeah. Okay. Public domain, if you do that, and, and, and like Jingle Bells or whatever, and you do some new version of that with some crazy in, arrangement, and, you, and you, you can register with BMI, and you can get paid public performance, but not the full rate. It's a, it's a reduced rate, like 50%. Um, Matty Dice wants to know if you have an er entertainment website that you want to protect from anyone stealing the concept or name of the site or movement or entertainment company, how do you protect it? I don't understand that question very well. Do you, Ben? Mm. Well, it sounds more like it's a trademark or maybe even a patent type of thing. I mean, when you have a name, by the way, a name is trademark. Copyright is, is music, usually. Mm -hmm. Names are trademarks. It's a different intellectual property. And then if you have something on your site that moves a certain way or a certain kind of, uh, okay. you, know, uh, you know, what makes your site unique in some way, if there's some technology, that that's going to be a patent thing. That maybe it's something unique on your site that nobody else has. That's patent law. You know? So I don't know if it sounds like some of these things are overlapping. I don't know. But, but again, if you just like... Website here, you could put copyright, trademark, patent, all owned by us, you know, or, you know, you're just giving notice to the public so they don't screw around and try to steal it or use it without your permission. I had somebody um, crawl our entire website, which I believe is some ridiculous number of pages. I mean, just ungodly number of pages. And somebody copied our entire website, every single word of it. And just did a find and replace all on the word taxi, and they changed the logo. You're, you're talking about in your terms and conditions? No, part? I'm talking about they copied our oh, entire the website. And, and then they came up with a site that was called, like, Limo Music Service. <laughs> and it looked exactly identical to ours. Had all the same verbiage on every single page. Had all of our photographs. Everything that I've written for 23 years okay. copied in its entirety. I mean, we're talking Well, so what? Now, that was a claim. You, that, did you well, shut I, them I, down? I called you? the guy up in Africa and told him I was getting on an airplane flying over there and I was going to hurt him. 
Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, they were in Africa. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and the guy said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know that my technical guy copied your website. Can we do business together? And I said, are you out of your freaking mind? You guys copied like thousands of our pages and now you... Well, wanted... did, did he take it down? Yeah, he did. Okay, that's that. good because sometimes when people are in Russia or Nigeria, they don't right. and you can't do much about it. You know, what? most people can't go over there and then even if you did, they're going to listen to some... Somebody from California? Yeah. I know their judges are different. You know? I was going to go over there and do battle with a, a warlord in West Africa with a baseball bat. <laughs> anyway, the guy did take it down. Oh, but well, he, but then he said, our two companies should merge. Yeah. Really? <laughs> okay. People are so weird. Um, okay, Ben, do you know a... Uh, do you know or following the or are you following this thing with Pandora paying us little and collecting full dollars from our listings? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I read about these things as they go along. None of this. I know there's been rulings and appeals, and it's not. A, I you know you're talking about most, most like ASCAP and BMI what they get paid by Pandora. Mostly it's public performance. That's right. what I'm. But I, I have followed as much as anybody else does. I mean, I'm hoping that the rates go up for Pandora and, and Spotify and all these things where ultimately they're paying more to the writers and the performers. And I think that will happen eventually, but it's obviously it's going to be a fight. I didn't realize we've been doing this for an hour and 41 minutes, so we need to wrap this up. But before we do, I promised you guys that, wow, thank you for hanging in there all this time, you guys. Um... Uh, ben has generously agreed to give somebody a half hour consult. So I wanted to make that little bonus for somebody today. So why don't you guys free, all, free consult, a free, free, consult. free yeah. consult. Yeah. So why don't you guys all just put your name in one time, please don't enter your name like a hundred times. Uh, just do type plus one and hit return. And I will go up and down with my finger. We'll stop on somebody's name and whoever that person is, We'll get a free, uh, did I say one hour, half hour, half hour, half hour consult? Yeah, usually ben. it's, unless they're just down the street, it would be by phone, probably. Right. Yeah. You're welcome, you guys. Watch all of a sudden, like a thousand plus ones will go by. I'm going <laughs> to wait for some to build up. And I will shut my eyes. Okay, and who did I land on? I landed on uh, TV Marino. All right. Tracy and Vance Marino. Meet your new attorney, Mr. Hey. Ben McLean. All right, I know those guys, so I will be able to hook you up with them easily. And, did, and at the beginning, I didn't... The, my contact information, they have a way of finding me. In the letter that I sent out, there's a link that takes them right to your website, okay. but your website is... Oh, benmcclain.com. B E N M C L A N E dot com. I'm in North Hollywood, California. And I've known Ben for years. He's only been to prison a few times. No, actually, Ben's a great guy. Um, I've never met anybody that didn't have anything uh, that didn't say great stuff about him. He knows what he's talking about. So there you go. Thank you all very much for watching today's show. And Ben, thank you yeah, for thank being you. here. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you here. And we will see you at the Road Rally coming up uh, November 5th through the 8th. Bye, you guys. See you next week. Or next week is a uh, holiday. We won't see you. Bye-bye.